Good morning. Welcome to Calvary's Sunday morning worship online. Uh, I'm not Pastor Brett. I'm Rev Tom. Pastor Brett unfortunately has been exposed to COVID. He's, we don't know if he's positive. We don't know if he's negative, but we're not taking any chances. So we told him, stay home, relax, decompress. Hopefully you don't have COVID. Uh, this is just a little bit of a break for him, uh, but be praying for that because we don't want Pastor Brett to get COVID and we want him back as soon as possible. Um, I am here with Tanya, part of the terrific tech team, as Pastor Brett would say, and uh, we're excited. We're excited to worship the Lord. Uh, that's what this is all about. It's about praising God and telling God how great He is in our lives and just, you know, just how amazed we are with all the things He does uh, to bless us, to, uh, to teach us, to guide us, all those different things. So I, we're going to sing today. We're going to have a little bit of the Word. We're going to just, just really, really pray about uh, some great things that have happened this past week and week and a half and also pray for some people that are struggling a little bit. So uh, it's going to be a great worship time. We are going to start out today with a song. It's an I worship song called your great name, your great name. So, and isn't that true? Uh, if you want to do a study, which would be amazing, is study the names of God. Go ahead and Google the names of God. You will find out that God has a lot of names and they all have incredible meaning. So sit back. If you want to sing, if you know the song, your great name, go ahead and do that. And we'll see you in a moment. Lost and saved, find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every fear has no place 
And it is a great name. Um, Elohim, a plural noun. So great, he couldn't be singular, right? Oh my gosh. Um, I get so excited about that. And I get excited about going to prayer, which is what we're going to do next. We're going to lift some people up. So if you would join me, uh, yeah, go to God in prayer right now. Father, we come to you and praise you. We have great praises. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much that Amy got her heart transplant. What an incredible, incredible thing. She has waited so long, Lord, and I know she's gone up and down and there's been discouragement, but you have been the encourager underneath her to get her to this point. For four years, she didn't have a heartbeat of her own. And now, Lord, now she is, she's, it's amazing. She's got a heart and it's beating and your life is in her. And we thank you for that. And we know that all of the glory goes to you. Thank you for the doctors and the skills and knowledge and wisdom you've given them to do these incredible things like a heart transplant. Thank you for um, just the family being around Amy and supporting her and her church family. And Lord, just thanks that, that uh, you've undergirded her during this entire process. We do ask, Lord, that now that the heart uh, uh, is working and there will be a quick recovery and Amy can get back to a life that she wants to have. Thank you for that. Lord, we also thank you for my friend Lydia who had the double lung transplant. Amazing. 10 days after being in the hospital, she's out. She's in, in housing now. Uh, doing great. No tubes. No, just awesome. Um, it, I, I just, it blows my mind, Lord, that you've given us knowledge to replace hearts and lungs and those kind of things. Uh, but that's, again, glory goes to you because you are the healer, you are the knowledge, you are the truth and the life, and, and you've breathed more life into Lydia, who, who, like Amy, probably wasn't gonna make it unless they had these transplants, Lord. So we just praise you. Oh, God, you are so good. Lord, we bring some, some concerns, though. Uh, Misty and her family have had a tragedy where an aunt has passed away unexpectedly. Um, Lord, we just, we just praise you that, that her, her spirit is with you and that she's glorified and perfected. But I ask, I ask for prayer for Misty and the family who are reeling a little bit. Uh, it's so hard to lose somebody unexpectedly. And Lord, so gird them up, as we say, and, and encourage them and give them uh, your love and your hand in this grieving process, Lord, as they come to grips with uh, the idea that this person uh, is with you, but not with them for a short time, Lord. Lord, I pray for, uh, for Nancy Grabo, uh, who had her surgery on Friday, didn't tell anybody. Uh, uh, she wrote me a note, Lord, saying she didn't want to jinx it by telling anybody. Uh, but it went okay. She had a little bit of a, a clot in the lung, Lord. We praise you for clearing that up and giving the doctors the skills again to do that. She's doing well. She's back on Facebook, Lord, which tells me she's feeling better. Just ask for a quick recovery um, and that it's the last surgery she's going to need, that this whole issue is resolved at this point, Lord. That'd be a real, real blessing. Uh, Lord, there, there's others uh, that are struggling with COVID, uh, like Kate. Uh, she's, she's feeling better, but still struggling with positive tests, Lord. So we just ask that your hand be on Kate and her family as they, they deal with this COVID stuff and all the others that are struggling with, um, you know, they feel crummy. It's not as bad as the first variants, but uh, just kind of getting through that. And, and, uh, uh, and again, not exposing others and all the things that we need to do to stay safe, Lord. Uh, we just appreciate you protecting this church because we've not had a lot of serious cases. We've had some families catch it, but Lord, your hand has been on this church. And we thank you so much for that. I want to pray for Marcy and, and Josh. They've just had such a struggle, Lord. You're, you know all about that. And, and they just, they really need some encouragement. They need some lifting up, Lord. And they need the Holy Spirit to come upon them in such a way that they don't, they know not only that we're all praying for them, but that you're just really lifting them up and letting them know that they're okay because they're in your hands. That would be a, a real blessing to them, Lord. Uh, Lord, we have uh, Tim Berg. Well, Berg, he also has COVID. Um, yeah, uh, nice guy, great guy, Lord. I, I just love Tim to death, and and uh, uh, I would ask that you get him through this quickly. Uh, he has to work, and this will probably keep him from work, and that will cause some issues, Lord. So I just ask you to be with him. I ask you also to be with Pat Drury, 
who's had some medical issues in this past week, some uh, discouragement, some frustrations with hospitals and those type of things. Uh, he's got a surgery coming up, Lord, and actually as we speak, uh, he's probably going in for this. And so Lord, just put your hand on him and the docs and get him through what he needs to get through uh, and uh, uh, get him back on his feet, Lord. And also have the dialysis timing work out a little bit because that's been a problem for him. Um, we thank you that Linda had her cataract surgery and she's recovering from that, Lord. Uh, it's amazing, amazing again, that you give us the knowledge to do something like take something out of somebody's eye. It, it, it amazes me, Lord. Thank you for that. Thank you that, that you know, these bodies, these broken, fallen bodies of ours, that you have given people knowledge to, to fix them and, and to give us relief from our pain and our, and, and our struggles with them, uh, to, to uh, uh, give us sight like, like Linda is going to have. Um, Lord, Linda is such a powerful prayer warrior for you and such a devoted disciple. Lord, I just ask that your hand is on her as she, as she moves forward with her recovery. Lord, I pray for this church. I pray that, that we can make an impact for you in the kingdom, that we are people that uh, are striving to be more Christ-like. We are people that, that when we go outside of this building, that we can share the love of Christ everywhere we go, Lord. Thank you for putting that in us. Thank you, Lord, for partnering with us and allowing us to do your ministry, uh, Lord, and just give us opportunities and open those doors for us to do the things you would have us do. And I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, it's time to get into God's Word. I got to tell you, you need your Bibles today. Uh, I'm going to uh, be going through a lot of Scripture. Uh, I'll be going through some things in Romans and First Thessalonians, and we got some things out of Galatians. Uh, so uh, let's let's be dexterous. Let's let's grab that Bible, grab your Bible app, whatever you're going to do. What I want to talk about today is uh, loving your neighbor. Remember that? Remember that that great command that says that you're supposed to love God and love others. Well, we're going to go through that today and and talk a little bit about exactly how we do that because it's not natural to us to actually do that. So, uh, you know, come along with me on this ride. So in Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40, I want to go through that. So it's Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament, okay? So let me read this to you. It's on the screen. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, remember these two groups, Pharisees and Sadducees, they were gathered together. So the Pharisees got together and they're like, well, he knocked out the Sadducees. Let's see what we can do to them. Then one of them, one of the Pharisees, which was a lawyer, you know it's always a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Okay, and in, one, in some versions it says, what is, the, what is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Okay, then he says this, he goes, and the second, wait, wasn't, wasn't there one? No, 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 and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all all the law and the prophets. Now let me let me go through this real quick um, at a at a fifty thousand foot level. So so what Jesus is saying is you got to love God with with all your mind, your deepest deepest thoughts, and you got to love Him with your deepest deepest emotions, heart, mind, soul, right? But then He says you got to love your neighbor as yourself. Now show of hands. How many of you love yourself? See, when I, I ask this question sometimes, and, and I, I don't get a lot of positive response, okay? Um, but Jesus says all of the law hangs on this, loving God and loving others as yourself. Everything in this book, everything in Scripture hangs on that. And I'll be tell you why. If you love God, you will do your best not to sin and break his laws and rebel against his moral law. If you love others, you'll do your best not to transgress against them and sacrifice uh, in, in serving them. And when you do those two things, when you're trying not to sin and you're trying not to transgress, everything in Scripture falls in place, doesn't it? But we suck at it. Honestly, we're just not very good at it. So when Jesus was talking about loving your neighbor, he, he wasn't saying something that was a new idea. In Leviticus 19, verses 18, he says this, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So this is a command from God himself. I am the Lord. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
But again, we don't actually love ourselves. And so then it is almost impossible for us to love others the way the command from God has us do it. So I want to break this down a little bit for you because in 1 Thessalonians we learn something about who we are, how we're made up. I'm going to go to 1 John first though and go, look, the love we have to give others, right? We love because God loved us first. Whoever claims to love God hates a brother or sister is a liar. So if you love God, it says you got you to gotta love others. But if you don't love yourself, how do you love others? But if God's loving you, see, there's, there's this, this, this dissonance. There's, there's this friction here. And it says, whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God. So if you don't love other people, you really can't love God. Whom they, you know, you've not seen God. So how can you love someone you've seen, or not love someone you've seen, but then love something you haven't? And that, that's kind of what John's argument here is. And then he says, and he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. I mean, these are, these are hard things because, again, if you don't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor as yourself. And then if you're not loving yourself, you're going to treat your neighbor the way you treat yourself. Now, let me ask you this question. Show of hands. Are most your thoughts positive or negative? I know the answer. All our thoughts are negative about ourselves, right? We're not doing this right. We're stupid here. We could have done that better. We second guess. Most of our negative thoughts, negative self-talk is what we call it, is tearing us down. And then we project that on other people because that's what's in our head. Now, Scripture tells us, too, that, that the over, what we speak is the overflow of the heart. Oh my goodness, it's the, your emotions, right? So this is a really pro a problematic thing for us because we are called clearly by Scripture. God himself has said, you will love others. If you love me, you will love others. So how do you do this? Let me get to 1 Thessalonians like I was talking about. This is fascinating. It says this in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through, the, through and through. So you're supposed to be fully sanctified, fully set apart. And this is this, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, we just learned something. We learned that we are made up of three parts. There is a spirit, there's a soul, and there's a body. Now here's what's fascinating. Most people think spirit and soul are the same thing. But I'm going to walk you through the Greek here because they're not at all the same thing. And this might surprise you. So, so you know, here we go. Spirit, the Greek word is pneuma. Okay, you've heard pneuma before, I think. It means breath or wind or spirit. Now, we know the Hebrew equivalent of ruach, right? God breathed life into Adam. So the spirit, the ruha, the, the, the pneuma, that is spirit. And spirit is this, this, this thing that we are. This thing that we are. Now, now the soul, on the other hand, is different. Listen to, the, listen to the Greek word. It is psyche. It, it, it's not spirit. It's your mind. Right? The Greek word psyche. And this is what it means. This is great. Doubt. Heart. Now, we're supposed to love our God with all our heart, mind, and soul. Right? So what, what Jesus is saying in heart, mind, soul, and in, in Leviticus, when it talks about loving our neighbor as ourselves, it's saying that our soul is this seat of emotions and our thinking. So soul is not when you die, your soul goes to heaven. No, your spirit goes to heaven. Your soul is actually how you're thinking about yourself. And again, our souls are, are kind of broken because the way we're thinking is, is, is broken, isn't it? And then we have the body, and the body's obvious. The word is soma. And it just means body. But one of, the, one of the definitions is fascinating. It means slave. Now, didn't Paul talk about not being a slave to sin? Didn't he talk about our flesh being, you know, uh, problematic because our flesh wants to fight against the spirit, which we'll get to? So what you get is, is this idea, so my body can be a slave. So a fascinating compartmentalization of our three parts, spirit, soul, and body. This guy named, uh, he, he, he was a Jesuit priest, uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, he said this, 
We are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And I love that because basically what he's saying is we are not bodies with a spirit. We are actually spirits in a body. And this is really, really important. It may seem semantic, but it's really, really important. When you live your life, you're supposed to live in the spirit because that's who you are. That's, who, that, that's, what, it, that's what you are. The body is just a container for all of this. And then what we think about is our body and, and, and our psyche being the main points of us and spirit comes later. It's got to be reversed. It's got to be reversed. You are spirit and you're living in a body having a humanistic experience. I, I think that's fascinating. I think it's wonderful. In Galatians, Paul kind of repeats himself. This is Galatians 5, 14 through 17. He says, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. There it is. He's repeating what Jesus said. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Right? So if you're not loving your neighbor as yourself, it's not going to work. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit. See, see, we don't live in the body. We don't live in the psyche. We walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the flesh when you're doing that. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. See, our bodies and our psyche, they want, they want things. They, they, they want to rebel against God. They, 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 they see shiny stuff. And, and the Spirit is contrary to that, saying, no, no. You know, we are connected to the Holy Spirit and we are connected to God and we are going to do His ways. And it says the Spirit is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want, right? You don't just, you don't just follow your impulses because your impulses are coming from your body and your mind. It's not coming from your spirit. Now, this is fascinating because in Romans, I finally made sense of this. For years, I just could not understand part of this. And I want to go through it for you because it is so vital to our understanding about how to love somebody else. Romans 7, 16 through 24, a little bit of a long passage, but hang with me because it's really good. It says, and if I do what I do not want to do, that's Paul, I agree that the law is good. I thought we're not under the law. Because he says, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but the sin living in me. Let me go through that because that's one of the most confusing things. He says, I'm not doing it, it's the sin in me. Well, it, is that just an excuse? It's you doing it, right? So let me, let me break this down. If I do what I don't want to do, I agree the law is good. See, he was saying that without the law, I don't know what good and evil is. The law tells us, do this, don't do that. And so without the law, we don't know what to do and what not to do. So the law is actually a good thing, even though we're not under the constraints of the law in terms of the consequences of it, because Jesus died on a cross and, and, and relieved us of that. What he's saying is the idea of the moral law, the idea of, of God says, this is what, how you live. That is a good thing because it gives us a reference for what is good and what is evil. Okay. But then he says this crazy thing. If as it is, it is no longer myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. And what he's really saying is, I am spirit. And when my, my flesh sins, that's not me, because I'm connected to God in spirit. It's just my fallen nature. And I am a new creation in Christ when I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and my spirit is regenerated. And now I'm connected to God, because I am spirit, living in a body that's fallen. And there's a conflict we learned in the last slide about it, right? So he's got this conflict. He says, but I, me, me, the spirit, I have nothing to do with that. Let me follow up. For I know that the good itself does not dwell in me. He's saying the good in my, in my nature, my fallen nature, it's not in me. That is my sinful nature, he says. So he's separating spirit from his body and his psyche. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. How many of us go through that? We have the desire to do exactly what God wants. I mean, how many times have I prayed, God, take my free will from me because I'm an idiot. I think we've all been there, right? Then Paul says, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Well, that's his sin nature. And he's fighting his spirit. He's saying, no, 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 I am God's. I, I belong to Christ, but my flesh is just uh, beating me. 
Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin living in me that does it. So again, he's saying, me, I'm spirit. I'm connected to Christ. I'm a new creation in Christ. The old man is gone. The new hand has come. And I am connected spiritually through the Holy Spirit in me with God himself. And my nature, my fallen sinful nature, I am stuck with it. I am stuck with it until I am reunited with the Lord. So I find this law at work, he says. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. We are kind of having this dualistic problem. I want to do good. I want to please God. I want to, do, I want to make Jesus proud of me. But that evil lives right in me. Oh, and it fights. He says, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. In my spirit, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind. He says, so I, in my inner being, my spirit, oh gosh, how much I want to do what God says. I love his law. I, you know, I love this book. Oh my gosh. But in, I got this war waging against my mind, my psyche. And it makes me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. I just love Paul because he is so honest about his condition. You know, he's, he's, not, he's not some holier-than-thou pastor telling you, you know, you, you all are sinners, and, but you know, got to be more like me. No, no, he's saying, of all the sinners, I'm the worst. And this is what I'm going through. He says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body, the body that is subject to death? Paul is crying out in Romans here, and I just love it because... I exactly feel what he's saying. It is so much me. It is so much how I feel every day. I feel my spirit fighting my flesh every moment of every day. It is so hard. But this is important. John 4, 24 says, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. Here we go again. God is saying, I don't connect with you in your fallen flesh. I don't connect with you in your fallen mind. I connect with you in your spirit because that's who you really are. Isn't that amazing? And you got to think that way because if you can break these three components down, then you'll understand something that's really, really important about loving your neighbor. There are three parts, spirit, soul, body. Which ones are corrupted by the fall and sin? I'll give you a hint. It's not our spirits. See, our body's corrupted. It's the sinful nature. Our minds are corrupted. I know what you're thinking. Jesus said, if you even think it, you've done it, right? Our minds are, they're, they're horrible. They're perverted. They're corrupted. They're sinful. But our spirit is not. So how do we love our neighbor? We love our neighbor in spirit. While striving to transform, Romans 12, our soul and our body into the likeness of Christ. So when I'm loving my neighbor as myself, if I'm trying to do it in my mind, people will drive me crazy. I will want to stick a fork in my eye. I, 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 you know, in my mind, ugh, I mean, ugh, extra grace required people, right? Just too much. My flesh desires things it shouldn't desire. They go completely against God. You know, for example, uh, I, I've shared with you all, I got PTSD and all that great stuff. When I get in crowds, whoo, my flesh wants to do things that it, yeah, I just want to, I always want to bust out of there, right? And I got to control all that. But what I'm trying to do with my mind and my body is renew it. Aren't we told to, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind? So we're told blatantly, your mind's not right. You've got to work on transforming. Now, we will strive till the day we die to be more Christ-like in our flesh and our mind. But our spirits, when they're regenerated, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, woo! you are now in the Holy of Holies. You are now seated with Christ in the heavenlies. You are now perfected. God sees you as a saint. You are awesome because your spirit is who it's supposed to be. You're connected to God. Woo! And we are, we are fine. So I have to love people not in my mind, not in my flesh. I got to love them in spirit. And that spirit is a perfect love. It's an agape love. It's a sacrificial love. Jesus said, you'll know my disciples by the way they love one another. And we love in the spirit. 
And that is why we can take people that are very difficult to love. We call it loving the unlovable. And we can love them. We can love, and this is going to be hard for you, but we can love the pedophile because we want them redeemed. We can love the worst murderers and the rapists and, and you know, think of your worst case. We can love those people. We can love the, the homeless. We can love gay folks. We can love transgender folks. We can love people of different ethnic backgrounds. Why? Because our spirit is connecting with people that are made in the image of God. We can show grace and mercy and forgiveness and non-judgmentalness and bearing with each other and turning the other cheek. All of that happens only in the spirit. It will not happen in the flesh and it will not happen in your mind. And so when I want to love somebody, I have to do it in spirit. So what does that look like? Well, the command is love God and love others. Love God in your deepest thoughts, in your deepest emotions. Cry out to him. Let him see everything. And love others the way you love yourself, which means you love your spirit. You love your regenerated spirit. You feel that Holy Spirit just oh, alive in you. I don't like my flesh. And I certainly don't like my mind. I don't love either one of those. And I'm fighting constantly, just like Paul over those things. But I love what God has done to my spirit. He has fundamentally transformed me miraculously, supernaturally, where I love people. Not in my mind and not in my flesh. But in my spirit, I can show the love of Christ to anybody because in God's economy, there are no throwaway people because they're all made in his image. So I want to challenge you today to think about your body, your soul, your psyche, and your spirit. And focus heavily on your spirit and understand you are spirit and make that the most important priority in your life is for your spirit to connect with the Holy Spirit, to connect to Jesus, connect to the Father, so that you can love your neighbor as yourself because you love your spirit and you want to share that love with others. And all God's people said, Amen.
For by your grace. You know, I, I, lo I love in Colossians 3, I think it's Colossians 3.10 that says, we need to bear with one another, right? Um, life's hard. People have friction. Sometimes your spirit and somebody else's spirit don't connect very well. But we are to bear with one another. And we're supposed to bear each other's burdens. And we're supposed to encourage one another. And we're supposed to lift each other up. And we're supposed to be that person that, like I talked about last week, that when you're in the sanctuary, you are the sanctuary. And when people meet you, they should feel just as comfortable as you do coming into the church. What an amazing gift God has given us to be partnering with him in this horrible, fallen, crazy world we live in that we can walk in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. And yet, it is well with us because our spirit is on fire. And I'll tell you what, that's going to happen. When you're on fire for the Lord, people recognize it and they will be a moss to a flame because they need what we have and you know how to share it. Thanks for coming today. It's been awesome. It's been awesome. I, I just love it. Good to see you. I want to uh, close in a word of prayer, so if you'd bow with me. Father, you are, uh, it's just awesome. When we think about just what you've done with us as your creation, your crowned glory creation, the, the one that, that you've set above all creation. I, I don't understand it. I'm like David, Lord, I, I, don't, I don't get it. But I'm so thankful that you see us as spirits and that you forgive our fallen nature, our flesh and our mind, that you forgive the idiocy that we do in it, and that you see us as completely healed through the blood of Christ as spirits. May all of us in the faith walk by the Spirit. May all of us in the faith <laughs> be people that exudes that Holy Spirit confidence and, and, and love and, and power through our spirit, which connects with you. And may you help us transform our flesh and our psyche in such a way that it becomes le less of a slave to sin and more of a slave to our spirit. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>